Not all of you are good surgeons. Not all of you will be good surgeons. If you're not going to be a good surgeon, don't do surgery. This is the know thyself part. You can learn to be a good surgeon. It, some, people, some of you will be able to learn to be a good surgeon. It's OK to be on the learning curve at this point in your career. But you need to have an idea about, um, sorry about that, who you are, what your comfort is. If it's super stressful for you to think about being the surgeon, doing the implantation, then don't do that. Partner with a surgeon. Um, do it together. It, sometimes you can partner with a surgeon all kinds of different ways. And in the, in the world, there's many different versions of this. I've told our fellows about how that worked for me. So the way it worked for me was there was a neurosurgeon who said, neurosurgeon who left my institution and went to work for Medtronic. The other his neurosurgery colleagues were suddenly stuck with all these stimulator referrals. They hated it. They asked me to start doing stimulation. This was many, many years ago. I started doing the trials for them. Then one of them placed a paddle at the wrong place. And they said, hey, can you come to the OR with us and help us place the paddles? And then when I changed institutions, the neurosurgeon said, these are easy. I'll monitor you. I'll show you how to do it. You can do it on your own. You don't need me. So that's how it worked for me. Everybody's different. When I talk about fellows, talk with fellows in private practice after they've left, they have a wide range of relationships with surgeons. So figure it out. It's not easy, but know where your comfort level is and where your skills are. So implantation. Lots of different people do it. There's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, it's basically two things, right? So there's implanting the leads and implanting the meat, the driver, the battery, the computer part, the IPG. Then there's a couple of phases to recovery. There's the three phases I can think of. The first is the first couple of weeks is just acute postoperative recovery. It takes six to eight weeks for the tissues to kind of be kind of solid and firm. And if you get an infection at 11 months, that's your infection, right? It's a year for a surgical site infection. So keep that in mind. There's a whole bunch of risks that are different for an implant versus a trial. You need to think about those. Infection is a big one. So the goals of the implant are to mimic or improve upon the trial lead placement, to anchor the leads really well so they don't move. I can't emphasize how important the anchoring is, and how much anchors have changed and so much better. So when I learned to put stimulators in, there was a silicon, there's a little sheath that went over there, and you tied it as tight as you felt like you could without squeezing the, ink to it, squeezing the lead too tight. And if it almost broke, perfect. That's how we anchored. It's not like that anymore. Um, you want no bleeding or infection. You want a smooth postoperative recovery. You want to min minimize infection risk for the long term. You want to be efficient and effective. And you want to be set up for the patient to maximize their outcomes over the long term. It's important to use a pre-op checklist. Here is one um, published in 2014. Have, know what you're going to do in advance. Do the same thing in advance every time. Go through a list. Don't miss the steps. Before entering the OR, make sure you, you remember what the trial was like, how you got in, where you put the leads, that kind of stuff. Decide how many leads you're going to use and where. Decide on which IPG, because every company makes more than one. Um, decide which one's the right one to do. Um, know the equipment you're going to need. Make sure the patient is medically optimized. This actually is surgery, so it's OK to have them visit their primary care and say, you're going to have surgery or medically optimized. Don't not know about their anticoagulation, for instance. Don't not know about their recurrent UTIs. You should need to, need to know these things. Evidence would suggest that if they're not smoking, they're at less risk for getting postoperative infection. Diabetes, you want to be well controlled. Opioids, I mentioned before, not being on opioids is better than being on opioids. And then usually we use monitored anesthesia care for the anesthetic. Think about multimodal analgesia to minimize the need of opioids afterwards. That includes gabapentin or pregabalin, celecoxib, acetaminophen, ketamine, magnesium, lots of local anesthetic, be generous. So prior to incision, chlorhexidine is the preferred um, technique. So you have patients take a shower the night before, the morning of, give them weight-based antibiotics. Here's the weight, here's the antibiotic choices that are listed um, in 2017 guidelines, recommendations, I should say. Before you make the incision, Position them well. It is only a little bit about their comfort, <laughs> right? It's your access and their comfort. 
If they're really comfortable curled up on their side, that's great, but you're not gonna like that, right? You want them to be in a position that makes it easy for you to get the leads in and efficiently. So you wanna kind of balance that some way or another. Some people use a Wilson frame, and the advantage of that, it has a little curve to it and lets the belly hang free. Others don't. Cervical, the neck moves easily, so I like a little cervical positioning device that helps hold the, position, the patient in position. Definitely sterile prep and drape. Some people use Ioban, I, I do. Double glove is a good standard to have. And depending on where you are, I have had the experience of everybody knows we're gonna use fluoro, and where's the, where's the fluoro tech? So I always, always, always hassle the, the circulating nurse to make sure the fluoro tech's there and ready to go. Incision, you wanna make an incision lower than you wanna go in. If you, want, if you want your needle entry to be at T12, no, T11, T12, then your incision needs to be below that, so by the time the needle gets there, you're there. The incision depends on the thickness of the patient and how you're going to anchor, but usually three to five centimeters in length is plenty. I use a mixture of, of lidocaine and bupivacaine with some epinephrine to minimize bleeding. I use tons of local anesthetic. If you get local anesthetic toxicity with this, you can get a case report out of it. It doesn't happen. Use a lot of local anesthetic, you're not gonna hurt anything. Want to make the patient more comfortable. So you carry on the incision down to a depth where all is firm. There's many ways of doing this. We can talk about that in there when we're doing the demos. Um, you wanna make sure you dissect enough adequately to be able to have a nice place to put the anchors before you put the needle in. Make sure you have good hemostasis and make sure you know where midline is. Lead placement. So paramedic approach, advance with control, plan for anchoring. And remember, you're a lot closer than when you're at the skin. So it feels different. And it, sometimes you know, it's surprising how little the dis distance is to get, oh, I'm in ligament, I'm in flavum already. So just be ready for that. And sometimes the needle's a little more wobbly than it is when you're coming from outside, even when you're in the right place. Um, anchoring is critical, right? <laughs> you want the leads to stay where you are. So there's, the modern anchors all have some kind of mechanical component to them to hold the leads in place. They have different materials, they have different ways of locking. But basically, you want to make sure you use a modern anchor and use it the way that's intended to be used. Um, make sure there's space for the, the snout of the anchor. Um, most of the time, if you're not going to use the fixate design, device, you place your sutures before you take the needle out. You put the anchoring device in place. And then you follow the instructions, especially early on. You can modify later as you decide what you like doing that the manufacturer gives you for how to do the anchoring. I would just say do that early on. So most of them have loops. One of the companies doesn't have loops. Do what they say to do about, about this. But really, make sure you're in good position. And make sure it's really secure and it's not going to move. OK, the so fixate device is not an anchor. It's a way of attaching the anchor to the tissues. Um, it is quicker, without a doubt. Um, another thing that's different is the Inject anchor from Medtronic is clearly is an anchor. It's deployed in a different manner than all the other ones. It, it does not have suture loops. So you just have to think about these differences as you go forward. So if the anchor is too superficial, it's going to move around. It's got to be deep into the fascia. If it's up in the air like this, it's not going to stay as much as if it's down reasonably flat. So that kind of makes a little dive into the fascia and is able to lie flat and you have space for it to do that. Um, there should be nothing loose. You need to plan this step so you have room for this. So if you end up like flailing around with your incision, getting access, and you're down at the bottom of your incision when you finally get in, you're not gonna have room to anchor, so you're gonna have to extend your incision. Um, if the patient is really thin, the anchor can be unpleasant, just as the device can. So you really have to have it off line, as deep as you can be without being too deep, and cover it with tissues when you go to cover, so it doesn't bother them. Um, and then after you've anchored is when you take your final imaging that says where you are. The pocket. So Kumar's data about pocket pain was really low. I don't believe that for a second. Pocket pain is pretty common. It's at least five to 10% of patients report pain at the pocket site, at where the IPG is. So really think about this. You don't want to be touching a bone. You want to be as deep as you can be for patient comfort, but still be able to be charged and programmed easily. These also are changing all the time, and the companies can tell you what they, what they want and what they like. There's many ways of doing this. Some people do a single incision and, and just put the IBG off the side of the same incision I put the IBG through. 
In that case, a three centimeter incision will not work for placing the leads, excuse me, off to the side there. Other people put a separate incision. There's multiple places you can put the IPG. We can talk about that in the lab. Um, when you're making the pocket, you're forming the pocket, you don't want to make a huge pocket and have the IPG swimming around in there. So it can swim sideways or upside down, and being mobile puts stress on leads and it's not good. So you tunnel usually away from things you care about, so the pocket's empty, you've made the pocket, you've anchored the leads, you tunnel from where the leads are to the empty pocket, putting a little strain relief loop inside the midline incision, and then enough extra lead to put strain relief there too behind the device. When you're tunneling, stay deep. Please don't do something really, really stupid like going too deep into the thoracic cavity or the peritoneum or kidney or something else. I've not seen that, but I've heard about it. Um, and I don't want to ever see it, please, <laughs> fellows. Thank you. Um, so then you connect it, and you assure there's electrical integrity, which your rep will tell you how they do it. Every, every company does it a little bit differently. You tighten down, and then you close. So I irrigate um, first to make sure the irrigation is clean. There's not like garbage coming out and blood. Make sure there's no um, bleeding. I put vancomycin powder in. I sometimes, if it's been a while, it's been like a challenging case, but definitely put extra local in at that time. Close tightly, leaving no dead space. Use absorbable interrupted, absorbable interrupted sutures deep, making a nice tight closure, and then a running suture under the skin. This is the way I do it. People do it different ways. Um, I put Dermabond on to make a nice occlusive um, seal, and I put a dressing on for one day, and the dressing comes off. There are experienced other people here who can tell you how they do it. Everybody does it a little bit differently, and we all have techniques that have evolved over time, how we do it. Post-op, it's reasonable to give your patients a few analgesics. Some people give oral antibiotics for the first 24 hours. I do. I didn't used to, but I started doing that. Um, I ask the person's partner, because usually the incisions are back here, to look, at the, to look at them day zero, day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way to the first 60 days every day to make sure the incisions are healing well and to call us if there's a problem. I love the fact that we have an electronic health record, and if they're signed up for eCare, they, which is my chart, they can take a picture, they can send us a picture, we can look at it and say, ah, let, that's okay, or ooh, we need to see you soon. So it's great to be able to communicate that way. So it's infection control guidelines, which you can read about in your own. Um, there's a lot of them. So for implant, there are many stamped steps to remember. Don't forget any of them. It's really embarrassing if you forget to anchor, for instance, or something else. Um, most of the steps are basically the same every time. You should have a routine of how you learn to do this. Some steps have some variation depending on who your patient is and what, the, what you're aiming for. It's important to practice things you can practice outside of the OR before you're in the OR, like suturing. You can practice that until, until your family is sick of you tying knots someplace and collaborate with others. So if you're an anesthesiologist or a physiatrist or some other specialty that's not a surgical specialty, you need to have a plan for what you're gonna do if it's a disaster. Who's gonna be your backup? Who's your surgery backup? I know who mine is, it's Andrew Coe. So I know exactly who my backup plan is. So you need to have a backup plan about who's gonna help you. And it can be really fun. And it's, it's a really satisfying thing to do, to do a good job and to really change your patient's life. So take the time to do it right, and it could be, it's, it's good for your patients, and it's a very satisfying part of your practice. Lots of YouTube links for it. Thank you very much for your attention. Now we get to see the real thing. <laughs>